Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Leticia Mo, and I'm the head of uh, sustainable finance at the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here physically in this room, uh, but also those that are joining us on the YouTube channel available at uh, COP27. This event is co-organized by the Global Green Growth Institute, also known as GGGI, and uh, the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. So today we wanted to focus on Africa, obviously, because uh, we are at COP27 in Egypt. Uh, but we also wanted to understand the role of Luxembourg in channeling capital flows towards more sustainable projects, infrastructure and technologies in the region. Uh, so what we will seek to understand today really are the gaps, the specific needs, the challenges that the region is facing, uh, but also how can local and international capital markets uh, make the difference uh, in that and also understand why cross-border collaboration and cooperation is so important and we'll also be discussing how uh, what we've been doing concretely so far and what we can we can do also in the future we'll have uh, one hour and 30 minutes i hope ahead in front of us so we'll have opening remarks at the beginning then we'll have a panel discussions with my brilliant panelists here uh, and then we'll have discussion and specificities on case studies and we'll uh, close up again with final remarks. So without further ado, I would like to welcome to the stage Mr. Frank Heiberschmann, Director General of uh, GGGI for his opening remarks. Frank, the floor is yours. Thank you, Leticia. Colleagues and friends here on the stage uh, for GGI, it's a pleasure to be here. We're still a young intergovernmental organization supporting our now 45 country members to accelerate their green transition. And back in 2016, when I had just started at GGI, I met Andre Weidenhaupt uh, of Luxembourg. And since that time, we've built quite a strong collaboration between GGI and Luxembourg, supporting interesting projects on climate resilient green water systems in Vanuatu, waste management, circular economy in places from uh, Senegal to Rwanda and so on, but also on green finance. Obviously, we know Luxembourg as a green finance hub, one of the strengths and interests of Luxembourg. And at GDGI, we have quite a few green finance projects. One of our strengths is to increase the access of our member countries to green and climate finance. The Green Climate Fund, private sector, and yes, capital markets. And we believe there is still a lot of scope for developing countries to increase their access to capital markets, either sovereign. We worked in Peru last year to get Peru ready to issue their largest sovereign sustainable bond at the time, more than $4 billion, and a social bond for a billion dollars. But then there are a lot of other countries where they don't really have the space to increase their sovereign debt. So it really is more through stock markets, stock exchanges, bonds that the private sector can participate in, there is a better opportunity. Not that much yet in Africa. In fact, I met Minister Zainab of Nigeria at one point recently here in Cairo and congratulated her on Nigeria being one of the first countries that issued a green bond. And she said, well, yes, it wasn't such a success because actually getting the money is the easy part. Finding good projects to invest the money in is the harder part. So that's, I think, what we're addressing today. How can we work together to increase the flow of good green projects that attract good green finance through the capital markets, through green bonds? And yes, we've had one project with, funded by Luxembourg and Vietnam, for instance, working with the Ministry of Finance, getting a green bonds framework in place. But in the end, it was a private bank that was the first to take advantage EVN, and it was indeed the kind of technical support provided by Luxembourg together with the credit guarantee from Garantco that put that into place. Those are the kind of things that we'd love to do more of. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of this uh, event, very happy to work as GGI with the Luxembourg Stock Exchange and with the other partners here on the stage. So welcome to this, I hope, very exciting side event. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, uh, for your remarks. And uh, we are very happy to see GGGI increase its presence uh, in Luxembourg as well. 
Now we have the pleasure to listen to a recorded message from the CEO of the Luxembourg uh, Stock Exchange and also founder of the Luxembourg Green Exchange, uh, Ms. Julie Becker. So let's play the video and uh, listen to her. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, dear all, it's a great honor to welcome you to this side event which we are organizing with the Global Green Growth Institute. Unfortunately, I'm not able to be in Sherman Sheikh with you in person. However, two of our leading sustainable finance experts are on the ground in Egypt and will guide you through this event. Ever since we established the Luxembourg Green Exchange or LGX in 2016, sustainable finance has been at the heart of our mission and strategy as an exchange. LGX is the world's leading platform for green, social, sustainability and sustainability linked bonds. Today, LGX encompasses more than 1,500 sustainable bonds from 255 issuers in 50 countries. In total, these bonds have raised more than 800 billion euro for sustainable development across the world. And while these figures illustrate the exponential growth we have seen in sustainable finance over the past years, they only tell one side of the story because sustainable finance is not growing at the same pace in all parts of the world. And the green and social projects financed through this mobilization of responsible capital are not equally spread across the world's continents. This is why the focus on a just transition is so important. At COP26 in Glasgow, one of the main takeaways was that developed countries have a responsibility to help finance the green transition in emerging markets. Rich countries have committed to mobilize 100 billion US dollars every year to support developing countries in their mitigation and adaptation efforts. And this remains one of the key focus points also at COP27, restoring trust and renewing solidarity between countries to deliver on the landmark Paris Agreement for people and the planet. A just transition is about making sure that no one is left behind as we transform the world economy and our societies into a greener and more inclusive models. It is also about allowing emerging and developing markets to embark on the green transition without sacrificing economic growth and social prosperity. And above all, it's about ensuring that the funds that are raised for climate finance reach the people and the countries that need them the most which happen to be those who have contributed the least to creating the climate crisis faced by the world today. This will, of course, require massive amounts of capital and public funding will not be enough. We need to mobilize private investment for climate solution. And this can only be successful when governments and companies work closely together towards the same goal, when stock exchanges help redirect capital flows towards sustainable developments. And when developed countries and emerging markets join forces and build up a joint response to the world's most pressing challenge. In his analysis of climate finance for Africa, Jean-Michel Severino, who previously led the French Development Agency, argues that the only way to ensure sustainable global growth is to seize the considerable opportunities that the demographic and economic transformation of the African continent can bring. Since COP26 in Glasgow, the teams at the Luxembourg Stock Exchange have focused our efforts on Africa. We have started to work with exchanges in Rwanda, in Cabo Verde, in Nigeria, and the regional West African Stock Exchange, BRVM. And we intend to build on these efforts and contribute to knowledge sharing and capacity building in the field of sustainable finance across Africa. We are signatory of the Net Zero Financial Services Provider Alliance and committed to Net Zero. Leticia Amon, our Head of Sustainable Finance, who is guiding you through this event, has been appointed to represent our exchange at the European Commission's high-level expert group on scaling up sustainable finance in low- and middle-income countries. We are committed to doing our part to mobilize, help mobilize financing for climate solutions across the world, and so are most of you, I believe. Today's event will focus on Africa, and our expert speakers will discuss how to scale up climate finance 
and close the funding gap in this part of the world. Thank you to our speakers and to our co-host GDDI, and thank you for tuning in. I wish you an insightful and inspiring event. Well, I would like to thank Ms. Becker for her words, and I'm sure she's watching us at the moment. As Julie mentioned, sustainable finance doesn't go at the same pace in every region of the world, and that's actually what we will be discussing with the panel today. So let me introduce them first, and then we'll have a discussion. So from the African Development Bank, we have Mr. Al Amdu Dorsuma, who is the director and manager for the bank's climate and green growth division. From the West African Stock Exchange, BRVM, uh, we have Mr. Edo Amenumve, Director General uh, of the West African Stock Exchange and also President of the African Securities Exchanges Association. Joining us from the EIB, the European Investment Bank, we have uh, the Chief Climate Change Expert, Ms. Nancy Seid. She made a huge effort in joining us today, despite some events. Um, she's also a rapporteur to the EU Sustainable Finance Platform. And finally, we have Virginie Gilbert, who is the Development Cooperation Officer at the Luxembourg Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the European Affairs. Uh, she's also the Ministry Expert Representative of the Management Board of the Luxembourg International Climate Fund. So thank you all very much for being here today. Let me start with a question to Mr. Uh, Dorsuma. The African Development Bank um, is investing a lot, obviously, in sustainable projects in Africa. Uh, so you have a thorough understanding of the specificities, the needs and the gaps in the regions and what kind of assets need to be financed there. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And first of all, thanks for uh, inviting the African Development Bank to this very important event and also for, for the focus on Africa. Uh, it is not because of the fact that COP27 is an African COP, but also, as you may know, uh, African countries are, have included in the COP agenda an item called consideration of Africa's specific needs and circumstances on climate change. So it's really uh, timely and uh, uh, critical that um, uh, you put the focus on, on Africa. Now, coming to your question, uh, as you know, there is this old uh, narrative on investing in Africa, where uh, you know, the focus has been more on the challenges, the risk. Uh, we all know that, but uh, less on the opportunities, uh, which are many, actually. And uh, I, I actually don't expect me to speak about the risk and challenges, which are well known but most on the opportunities and how we can address the challenges. Me, in my view, I think um, Africa is a continent where the development and climate finance needs are huge. And opportunities are there in various investment sectors, like agriculture. How do we build resilient and sustainable agriculture in Africa, which is actually the main economic activity in the continent. But agriculture is also the, the sector that suffers the most of the climate impacts. Uh, water, you know, access to water is still an issue. While the continent is, uh, it has abundant water resources. So how can we harness that opportunity? On, on, on infrastructure, you know, 70% of Africa's infrastructure is yet to be built. This is a huge investment opportunity, both for public and also private sector. So there are many sectors like that uh, that uh, we are, there, are, there are opportunities, including bringing in technology. Yeah, I think everybody is aware of the fact that Africa has the potential to leapfrog to new technologies without necessarily repeating the same mistakes that the other parts of the region have made. So opportunities are there. We know the challenges, and we know how to address them. Actually, one of the challenges that um, Africa is facing is on the on the governance side, the policy aspects, the, the regulatory processes that are, yet not, that are not yet ready to facilitate investment. So if we are able to support governments to improve the regulatory frameworks, the policy uh, regulations, to make sure that the capacity also is strengthened because 
many African institutions are lacking capacity to attract climate finance for instance because of the lack of expertise and even when they are able to mobilize climate finance implementation capacity is an issue uh, so uh, absorbing the funds that, are the, that they are able to mobilize another important challenge and I'm, uh, Frank has mentioned that the bankability of projects everybody is saying that money is not a problem but where are the projects where are the bankable projects it's true uh, project ideas concepts are there but are they bankable are they investable so this is an area where we really need to work on and the FDB is already really doing that. We have several technical assistance facilities that are helping countries to, to improve the bankability of their project. Sometimes it has to do with feasibility studies. It has to do with climate risk assessment, etc. So the tools that we have are able to do that. But we cannot do that for, uh, for 54 African countries alone. We need also to get other people with us in order to achieve this um, this objective and address those challenges. Thank you. Well, that's, uh, I guess, a very important message to mention that we should maybe shift our, the, the way we talk about Africa and maybe stop focusing on the risks, but also on the opportunities that you mentioned. Uh, and you mentioned capacity building. I think we'll come back to that later in the discussions. Uh, but first, I wanted to turn to Mr. Aminouve because to address these opportunities as well, we need capital markets. And um, the Association of Stock Exchanges uh, in Africa has come up with a very innovative idea, actually, is to have a common trading platform to facilitate capital flows and to give more liquidity uh, to those African markets as well. C can you tell us more about that, how it works, and how it's beneficial also to foster capital flows to environmental and social projects in Africa? Thank you very much, uh, Leticia. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Luxembourg Stock Exchange to inviting me uh, and the BRVM and the African Security and Exchange Association to this uh, side event. Uh, allow me to present briefly the BRVM. The BRVM is the stock exchange that is the unique experience in the world of an exchange shared by many countries. We have eight countries involved in the BRVM, Benin, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea-Bissau, Mali, Niger, Senegal, and Togo. Uh, we started our experience uh, 25 years ago, and uh, we can say that uh, it is a success today because uh, our market is ranked at the sixth position in Africa with uh, 27 billion US dollar of market capitalization, 45 listed companies, and uh, 100 listed bonds. The African Securities and Exchanges Association, the ASEA, is the premier association between all the 29 exchanges on the continent, from Cairo to Johannesburg. The main objective of our association is to strengthen the collaboration between our exchanges, but also promote uh, African exchanges on the continent and outside of the continent. You know that uh, uh, our continent and our exchanges are, are suffering of lack of liquidity and attractiveness. So we come uh, with the idea to have a kind of integration between all the exchanges on the continent so we can have a bigger market and we can offer uh, a large uh, opportunity to investors and issuers to, to raise money or to invest in a, a continental market. The African Exchanges Linkage Project is uh, an initiative of the AFDB, uh, the ASEA, and the Korea Africa Economic uh, Fund for Cooperation. Uh, we work on this project during the last three years, and uh, we will uh, launch officially the first one of the project. The first one of the project is the, uh, the first that uh, in which all the uh, investors, local or foreign, can access only one other book at the continental level to make the uh, uh, tradings on the, on the securities. Uh, this surely may bring liquidity to African capital markets. Uh, we will start this phase in December. Uh, the official launch will be in Abidjan, uh, 
uh, on the side of our annual conference. We have another two phases for this project, which is a global integration project of uh, our capital market in Africa. In phase two and phase three, uh, we will give to our brokers uh, uh, a common passport so they can go through the continent without uh, have a license by a, a, each country. And this can give also the opportunity to our states and to our private sector to raise funds on a unique market, a big market. Uh, this can give us the opportunity to finance uh, infrastructures, private sector, and accelerate the economic development of our continent. We believe that that is the only way for Africa to be uh, competitive with the other continent in terms of capital market, in terms of attracting uh, cash flow to our continent. Uh, regarding the, the sustainability aspect, we can say that ASEA uh, has already adopted uh, in his st strategic plan uh, these, uh, these sustainable finance uh, tools. And we are working with uh, our, all our partners like Luxembourg Stock Exchange to, to, to make it a reality because we think that it is important for our continent to attract this new kind of investors that are willing to invest in uh, bonds, uh, social bonds, uh, green bonds, etc., to finance uh, this uh, kind of project on our continent and make uh, green finance reality in Africa. Thank you, Mr. Amenouve. That really is, and I think for the audience to remember, it's, it's super important to see those uh, initiatives that are empowering uh, local stock exchanges and also regional stock exchanges uh, there so that Africa can also you know, attract capital flows there. Very innovative uh, project. I wish you luck on that. Uh, and also, it's probably going to be an inspiration for other regions uh, of the world. Now, turning to Nancy, and we'll have to share a mic. Um, I wanted to know, you know, that the EU Commission and the EU taxonomy focuses on defining activities that substantially contribute to the environment. That's a good thing. But what we see in Africa is there are also transition activities that need to be financed. So there is a missing middle here between activities that substantially contribute and activities that do significant harm to the environment. There is a middle here, and I would like to know uh, how is that addressed by the EU Sustainable Finance Platform and what do we do about that transition aspect? So thank you, Letitia, and thank you very much for inviting the EIB to join this event. Um, actually, we're also in the EIB Benelux Pavilion, so I suppose I should be also saying, you know, thank you for coming to our pavilion. Um, very quickly, before I go to the platform, uh, the EIB is, of course, the EU's bank, but it's a global multilateral development bank. It issued the world's first green bond in 2007, and it has been gradually transforming itself into the climate bank, which is a major transition, which involves every part of the bank. Um, and that part of that also is linked to a bigger focus on the development part of, of the bank. We've been doing uh, work in developing countries and emerging economies for 50 years, but we have now created a special arm of the bank called EIB Global to focus more. Uh, we've always had offices in a number of countries, but we're going to have much more financial experts and technical experts on the ground, and we're going to open more offices. And this is obviously particularly important in Africa. We've been opening a number of, of new offices in Africa al already. Um, but turning to the, to the EU platform, and I, and I think I should be honest by saying I was the rapporteur of the platform as of the 1st of November, um, the platform in its first two-year iteration has, has finished. But yes, I had the privilege to represent the bank and be the rapporteur of a group that exactly tackled that question. What about transition in the whole economy? And although I would absolutely say we need to make every effort to drive more finance towards low carbon uh, investments, adaptation investments, circular economy investments, all of those things, the green finance, which by the way, at the bank we like to call climate action and environmental sustainability. It, it sounds a bit complicated, but we, we wanted to make clear to people what it was under green, climate action and environmental sustainability. But that is not everything. There is the rest of the economy that also urgently needs to transition. And some of that cannot perhaps right now get to a low carbon 
and circular stage. So, but moving away from what you said, uh, you know, position of causing harm to the environmental objectives or to the Paris goals is super important. And that is very relevant, I think, in all parts of the world. Um, but when we think about Africa, there are some specific issues. And particularly when we look at supply chains and the opportunities, I think it's very, very clear. We believe in the platform that there are opportunities for this, if you like, wider transition and to mobilize finance for that. Now, whether you call it intermediate or whether, as the platform suggested, you call it amber transition, it doesn't matter what you call it. What is important is that we can mobilize finance for green, but we can also mobilize finance for the whole economy that has to move, and that includes public and private entities. And when I say move to that transition, we made it clear that we didn't just mean the mitigation objective. We meant all six objectives in the EU taxonomy. So that's mitigation, adaptation, circular economy, water, which of course you, you mentioned, Alhamdu, the importance of addressing the sustainable water use in Africa, but also biodiversity and nature and depollution. And although most of the international efforts have started with mitigation, and I fully understand that, I think we also need to consider that the transition actually, if it's going to be successful, has to look at this wider environmental issues as well. And particularly when we think about agriculture and some of the opportunities, as, as, as has been mentioned, to leapfrog old technologies and really, in Africa in particular, uh, move to uh, the opportunity of a, of, of a path which, which misses out some of those things and, and really takes the opportunity of going to the, the future sustainable world that we want to, to want to be in. So I'll stop there. Um, but I do think that this is a really important discussion where we have to think about all the different ways where we can bring public and private finance to make this big shift that we need to make very quickly. Yeah, thank you. And um, the fact that transition activities are also addressed now and think upon really addresses one of or one of the challenges that Mr. Dorsuma mentioned, especially agriculture and water resources. So that's super important that we consider that as well. So that it's not only environmental activities, but also transition activities that are considered. Now, turning to Virginie, um, over the last years, uh, the Luxembourg Corporation has been uh, very active uh, within African countries. And that's the, the Luxembourg Corporation has reinforced its work in terms of uh, inclusive and innovative finance. That, that's very new, I, term, I, I think, in terms of cooperation. So can you tell us more about that and why have you chosen this approach specifically? Well, thank you. Actually, I think that everything that has been said until now could be used to answer this question, why the Luxembourg Corporation is now focusing on this. Um, there are many reasons. If I can give a, a brief background, um, in Luxembourg, we dedicate 1% of our GNI to official development aid. But we also have the Ministry of Environment and Climate that is working, that is implementing um, an additional climate fund that is additional to the ODA. And then we also have the Ministry of Finance that also works on impact investments. So we are, as here also in Luxembourg, uh, government, many actors working on this. Um, so we are, are strengthening this collaboration, but we also uh, look at how to get a specific role. And I think if we want to have a national coherent uh, approach and optimize impact, we have to work closely together and um, coordinate to, to, to respond to the needs and, and help implementing the SDGs. So at the, um, I'm actually in charge of environment and climate change at Luxembourg Corporation. We launched a new strategy last year that takes into account these different actors at government level and the partners we already have. Um, we also include a gender equality directly in all our climate action because uh, we are convinced that climate impact is not gender neutral and has to take these elements also into account. Um, of course, we have an implementation, an action plan to implement these strategies uh, in the next few years. And our uh, inclusive and innovative finance team uh, plays a big role in this implementation plan. They have, if I, if I can sum up, they have, they have a lot of duties, but if I can sum them up, they have, of course, um, they are in charge of with the existing partners. They have to um, encourage the greening of the financial sector. 
um, they should also, and they are, identifying new um, financial um, instruments that we can use to, to strengthen our impact in this field. And then, of course, uh, they are also, with the other ministries, promoting the expertise we have in Luxembourg in this area, which is a very important one because as has been mentioned, we have the first um, uh, green exchange, uh, the Luxembourg uh, Green Exchange as part of the Luxembourg Stock Exchange, uh, which is now the world leader, but with this expertise, we can help other countries, other regions to develop uh, the same kind of financial places. Um, I think this is a very important shift since Luxembourg Corporation is not new in the financial area. We started in the 90s with microfinance, which led us today to accounting for over 70% of the MIV assets and the management. So I really believe that with this work now um, going forward and also working more closely with the other governments in Luxembourg, I feel that we can we can maybe get to the same kind of success story and, uh, and, and help as much as we, as we can responding to the needs of our partner countries to, to implement together the SDGs. And it's about also developing our financial place because we talk a lot about developing countries, but we have to develop our countries too because we are actually a big part of the problem that we are addressing here. So, yes, thank you. No, absolutely, and, and I find it very innovative and specific to Luxembourg, that national cooperation that we have between the ministries. I can also testify on behalf of the Luxembourg Stock Exchange, we've been very active over the last years, actually, uh, working with the cooperation uh, on specific projects in, in Africa and in other regions of the world. So, that's uh, good to hear. Talking about cooperation, I wanted to turn to Mr. Amenunve because there is one uh, cooperation agreement that I'd like to mention as well. Actually, BRVM has signed a cooperation agreement with the Luxembourg Stock Exchange very recently. Uh, and the masterpiece of this agreement is about building capacity and that echoes to what Mr. Dorsuma said earlier. Capacity building is needed and uh, the agreement talks about links between the LGX Academy and the BRMV Academy. Could you tell us more about that as well? Uh, th thank you. Um, uh, as you know, capacity building is uh, key uh, uh, in Africa and in the financial uh, uh, system of Africa. Uh, without a strong uh, program of capacity building, we cannot create an ecosystem that can uh, attract and that can be competitive with the other part of the world. Uh, so uh, for our association and for all our members, we focus on capacity building. It is very, very important for us. Uh, it is for that reason that uh, in the uh, sustainable finance aspect, we decided to partner with uh, the Luxembourg Stock Exchange because they are the leader in the world in terms of uh, sustainable finance. So uh, we signed uh, in September a memorandum of understanding with the Luxembourg Stock Exchange uh, to work on three aspects. The first one is to see how they can help the BRVM to create uh, a board or a, a market dedicated to a green, social, and sustainable uh, bonds in, in the West African region. Uh, we will work also on how we can have a cross listing between our, our two markets for the bonds that are issued by some of our institutions in Africa that are listed on the Lost of Stock Exchange. And lastly, uh, it is the capacity building program. We are creating in the BRVM, uh, BRVM Academy to uh, train our, our market players, etc. Uh, so we think that is important for us to benefit from the experience of the Luxembourg Stock Exchange to help us to uh, run this kind of uh, uh, training program. Uh, we hope that uh, it is the start point of a good cooperation between our stock exchange, BRVM, and Luxembourg, and also between our uh, association, ASEA, and the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. Okay, thank you. So we talked about the need for defining transition activities. We said that international cooperation, especially between stock exchanges, is also very important. 
Uh, now, there is another element that was slightly mentioned by Virginie, but I would like to uh, keep on talking about that, and that's the role that women can play in terms of the transition. So I would like to ask uh, Mr. Dosuma, and especially so the African Development Bank, uh, has issued green bonds and social bonds, and on the social bonds that you've issued, they are specific key performance indicators to track how um, females or, or yeah, females can benefit from the proceeds raised by those bonds. They are actually also displayed uh, and flagged as gender-focused bonds on the Luxembourg Green Exchange. So I wanted to understand your views about how uh, gender finance can also be beneficial for Africa. Thanks. Um, the, before I address your question, please note that um, gender mainstreaming has been already there in our operation for more than 10 years now. We apply what we call the gender market system to categorize our project for their focus on gender aspects. So from those that are doing well up to those that, are minimal, that have minimal gender consideration and how we can build an action, a gender action plan to strengthen the gender aspects of our operations. Currently, 90% of our public sector operations have mainstream uh, gender into the design up to the implementation. The objective is to reach 100%, but uh, yet I think we have a lot to do on uh, private sector operations. Uh, so this is just to, to tell you that uh, gender considerations are very critical in our operations. Now, coming to your point relating to the green bonds and social bonds, actually, we have um, more than 10 years, almost 10 years experience already on green bonds. Our first green bond, I think, was issued in 2013. And as I speak, we do have a portfolio of about 10 billion green bonds already issued and allocated more than 100 projects. Um, so again, it, it, it wasn't easy, the challenge of identifying good projects for which the proceeds from the green bonds have to be allocated. So it has been difficult, but we, so I think we have, over the last 10 years, made significant effort to, to allocate the 10 billion that we have mobilized through green bonds to, to those projects. Uh, the last, I think one of the last bonds that we issued was the social bond. I, I think it was related to the COVID recovery um, uh, the, 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 it was a three billion uh, social bond. Uh, we focus also on gender aspects, using the gender market system that we have been applying already, identifying what are the critical gender indicators that we can use before allocating the proceeds of the, of the social bond. Uh, it's a new one, I think it's almost in one year now. It is under implementation. I hope by, by the end of this year we'll be able to get the implementation report of the of the social bond and uh, tell you where we are especially on the allocation of um, of the proceeds to spe specific gender related uh, outcomes and outputs because it was part of the the social bond as it was adopted uh, uh, issued last year thank you well, thank you. I think the EIB also actually screens their uh, projects on uh, gender aspects. Uh, but talking, so we, we've talked about gender finance, but there is also a, another, uh, as an en enabler, sorry, for uh, the transition, but there is also an aspect that we should not forget, and that's those uh, SMEs in Africa that are in the supply chain of those large companies that need to transition. They usually are family-owned business in Africa, and they also need to transition, but they are sometimes forgotten. Uh, but I think the EU Sustainable Finance Platform is reflecting on that. Nancy, can you tell us more about that? Yes, I think that one of the things that the, the EIB and, and indeed other MDBs bring to the discussion on sustainable finance is to say, of course, it's important that we have a focus on corporates, stock exchanges, uh, and large-scale uh, private finance being mobilized. But in many countries, um, the largest part of the economy is SMEs. And uh, they are usually financed through the local banks in that country or, or in that region. And it is, they are usually financed through debt, through lending. It's terribly important that we remember that part of the market as well and support banks 
uh, in their own greening of their work with SMEs and the greening of those SMEs. Now, those SMEs may not themselves be low carbon, they may be in the supply chain or the delivery chain of, a, of another industry, or they may be delivering a social service. So they might be delivering um, you know, uh, something that's related to health or education. And in some of the, the, the developing countries, in fact, coming back to the point that um, African Development Bank made, when you get to the very smallest companies, the really the micro enterprises, they are often actually uh, run by women. So there is an interlinkage with SMEs, um, with gender, and with the need to green this part of the economy that sometimes gets if I, uh, left behind in a way in terms of the thinking. Now, one of the reasons we have to think about it is in more, more proactively, and, and I think that there is an opportunity in the issuance of social and sustainability bonds for this, is this huge part of the economy that's SMEs, they need to transform as well, and they need to become resilient. Um, I was working in the Caribbean um, many years ago with the Caribbean Development Bank, and we were already challenged by how do we support the smallest businesses to become resilient? They are actually probably the most vulnerable businesses, and yet it's the hardest to work out how to reach them for building resilience. The same applies with just transition. Um, in many cases, those small businesses that are struggling to deal with the economic shocks we're experiencing right now may not even be aware whether they are in the supply chain or delivery chain of a bigger industry that is transforming. And that if they are not given support to transform, the jobs and the livelihoods in those businesses, whether they are you know, small-scale farming or whatever they are, are at risk. And so I would say that this issue of resilience and just transition for SMEs is particularly important in Africa, probably not only for Africa, but very important in Africa. And I think that coming back to the capacity building point, you can't really address this properly unless you have technical assistance and capacity building on this specific point, as well as the other things we've talked about. Because it is harder, um, it is harder to reach those very small businesses. Uh, they have the least capacity to do this kind of strategic thinking. And yet a huge part of the economy depends on them and a huge amount of livelihoods and people's well-being depends on them. So I would just say, I don't have all the answers, but we must remember that part of the market when we're looking at all the things we need to do and the capacity building we need to do for banks in Africa and in other parts of the developing world. Yeah, no, that's an important message. Um, now to finish up, I'd like to turn back to Virginie again uh, to ask you whether you could share some concrete examples of uh, what initiatives does the Luxembourg Corporation support, uh, especially in Africa? Yes, um, so w we see the trend on increasingly uh, mobilizing private sector and uh, the financial markets are, are developing more and more instruments um, to, to make them help implementing the SDGs. So Luxembourg Corporation had to kind of focus on some specific criteria. So we are looking into um, specifically multi-stakeholder partnerships and then these public-private partnerships uh, specifically. There's the ABC Fund, Block Smart Africa, Build Sub Funds, we have actually, I wouldn't name them all, they are, um, there are many that, uh, that uh, use this, always this approach of public-private and multi-stakeholder partnerships. The idea is that I think as, um, as the other ministries in Luxembourg, we, we want to drive change and, and therefore we are willing to absorb um, the risk in initiatives we believe in. So it's, it's really about absorbing this risk. We believe that um, SDGs are worthwhile in investment case and therefore we have provided already 12 million euros first loss capital to this, to this impact driven funds. Um, I will also name the SNOOP, Smallholder Safety Net Upscaling Program that we launched in 2020, in October 2020 during the pandemic, during the crisis with our colleagues from Switzerland actually. It refinanced private impact investors' uh, TAs facilities. Um, we're also supporting the OECD directly to further scale up the GSSS bonds market. And then one other partner I could name is the CGAP, who is strengthening climate resilience and adaptation through financial services and loan sharing. So 
these are a few of many initiatives that we are we are supporting. Um, as you mentioned, we are. It's a new approach of strengthening this, this area in Luxembourg Cooperation is one of the many instruments we use to, to try to help uh, our partner countries in, in, in their development objectives and we're willing to, to strengthen this approach further in the future. Thank you Virginie. Well, as a summary of this panel, we heard uh, many great things. We heard that there's not only risks, but also great opportunities uh, to invest in Africa. Uh, there are also ways of addressing them through climate adaptation, through transition, through gender finance as well, through international cooperation and collaboration. So this is very encouraging for uh, Luxembourg, and I think that we can uh, further work on, on some of those ideas and, and partnerships and collaboration that we mentioned now. So please uh, join me in thanking the panel today for their insightful uh, remarks. I will ask you, except for Nancy, to go back to your seats and I will welcome Chiara Caprioli. I will just move there then. Thank you. So let me now introduce you to my colleague, Chiara Caprioli, who is Senior Business Development Manager at the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. She was also there when the Luxembourg Green Exchange was created back in 2016. And she's a very dedicated academy lecturer for the LGX Academy as well. So Chiara, we heard cooperation among exchanges can be uh, a lever to scale up domestic markets. Uh, how would that work? And what is the Luxembourg Stock Exchange doing in that field specifically? Thanks. <coughs> Thanks for the introduction, Leticia. So, uh, first of all, uh, we heard it before. Uh, we heard an example for BBRB. This is just the last of an example of cooperation we have in place with stock exchanges, so with our peers. And it's not a coincidence that all of the cooperation initiative we have with exchanges are with exchanges in emerging markets. So, we heard it in the initial video with, uh, from our CEO. We have already four uh, cooperation agreement with four African exchanges, BBRBD and the uh, Rwanda Stock Exchange, the Exchange of Cap Verde and also of Nigeria. There's a couple more that also come from emerging markets. Uh, we did uh, sign a um, MOU, a memorandum of understanding with the Santiago Stock Exchange and we have one additional MOU with INX in India. Now, that's a strong signal that there is an interest to leverage our experience with the LGX, meaning to replicate the infrastructure, to hint to the market, where uh, strong uh, ESG investment opportunities rely and to encourage a high level of transparency by the same token. And we know transparency is important in the market, still now, but it is particularly important at the very initial stages of market development and infrastructure development. Now, what I would like to say is that all our efforts in this field, in the field of international corporations, are actually aiming at scaling up the market. The green social sustainability and sustainability linked bond market is only uh, represented at the level of 6% by issuers in emerging markets, and that's not even 1% for Africa. Now, for Africa, the data might be a bit underrepresented. Uh, we know a lot of climate finance flows into Africa uh, via other products than debt products, but this uh, less than 1% is really not meaningful if we uh, benchmark it to the potential of Africa to combine uh, economic development with sustainability. So we need, we do have a role in scaling up the market and we do have a role to bring the market closer together to make sure that the market can flourish in a much more integrated manner and we believe there is a win-win option for domestic and international markets. So what is it that we are doing at the end of the day with, the, with our peers? Uh, we have basically the same model that we are uh, implementing with all of these exchanges with of course some local adaptations and our model is based on two big axes. The first one is the promotion of dual listings. 
uh, we allow local domestic issuers to list on their domestic market but also on the international uh, exchange, the Luxembourg Green Exchange, by the same token. Why is that important? Um, investors, um, m most of these issuers have so far a domestic uh, investor base. Uh, the international side of the business is still pretty much and most exclusively made up by multilateral development banks. Now, more international investors would like to invest into these products, but this product might just not be visible enough because they are just hidden in the domestic market dimension, first of all. And secondly, they might not have the transparency standard that are requested for investors to do their impact consideration and be able to report on their final um, uh, impact, basically. So that's where we're stepping in. We're giving an additional pool of uh, capital to local issuers. And dual listing uh, has a big assumption. That is that both sides of the equation, both uh, exchanges, uh, will have to work to smooth out their processes, meaning they will have to have compatible processes, and especially when it comes to sustainable security, common minimum level of transparency, so initial threshold, uh, not to create some confusion to the final investors, not to create bottlenecks in the, in the project. And that's what we are doing with, in a more or less in a more or advanced stage with all of these exchanges. Uh, the second big axe of cooperation is um, technical assistance and education. We have an academy that we run fully offline and we're happy uh, of the opportunity that has allowed us to accommodate with many um, time zones and be able to deliver courses to a lot of emerging markets. Uh, in relation to taxonomies, products, product codification, but also case studies we want to keep uh, knowledge as pragmatic as possible and to show the market that a number of issues are already out there. They can just be analyzed and possibly being replicated without reinventing the wheel every time. Um, in the interest of time, I would just like maybe to mention one of these uh, agreements. The one we close with the Capver Exchange is actually the, long, uh, the longest cooperation agreement we have. We started two years ago with education, skilling up members of the exchange, of the Minister of Finance, of the clear, local clearing houses and some private banks uh, participants as well. And then we continue with technical assistance um, with the exchange uh, that has allowed the exchange to work on a project which is the, the launch of the Blue X platform. It's a platform entirely dedicated to sustainable security, any type, but specifically blue economy, uh, securities investors in the blue economy, knowing the potential, not just of Capware, but all the continent to, to bring projects around, um, around this area. Uh, the stock exchange is also working on a taxonomy and uh, we are, of course, looking at the next steps, which would be to look at the technical details of dual listings and also look at the international promotion of the exchange and of domestic Cap Verdean issuers. Thank you, Chiara. So you mentioned transparency and trust uh, several times, and that's what we are trying, and aligning with the standards, that's what we are trying to do with our peer uh, stock exchanges that we are working with. But aside uh, from peer-to-peer -peer cooperation, are there any other touching points with African issuer that you've experienced you can yeah, share? Uh, we, we already have a number of African issuers. Unfortunately, though, a lot of these are, only, are not diversified enough. We have a lot of multilateral development banks investing into Africa, especially the regional one, African Development Bank and West African Development Bank. We do have a number of private sector issuers, but they are limited, as I said before, in relation to the potential of the continent. And what we notice is that the, the touch point are especially with frontier markets. They are markets that seems to be a bit more um, mature when it's about capital markets and sustainable finance. For instance, Kenya, uh, Nigeria, South Africa, of course, Benin, and Egypt, last but not least. <laughs> and uh, um, there is one initiative that we launched pretty 
recently that is approaching us even further to the needs of the African continent, and that's the, uh, our role within gender finance. I'm looking straight for those who are present to someone in the first row. We have the pleasure to have here uh, Mrs. Anita Bati, Batia, uh, United Nations Executive Director for uh, the UN uh, Women Empowerment Principles specifically, and we did sign with the United Nations, um, uh, the, the uh, WEP, uh, Women Empowerment Principles, uh, earlier this year, and we have an action plan that among other includes our role in flagging to the market those that products that are not just intentional, but that actually show impact on gender projects, meaning generally speaking SDG uh, 5 related objectives, but especially if you look into details of what is happening is uh, women empowerment, uh, um, shortening the, the gender gap, via education, via female entrepreneurship, via access to finance, etc. Now, this has allowed to get even closer to the African uh, base of actors. Uh, I would like to mention a couple of um, case studies or um, uh, real, yes, real uh, product that have been brought to market. One is um, a social bond, which turns out to be a 100% gender bond uh, by uh, NMB, uh, Tanzanian Bank, of which I also see, proud to see the treasurer here with us today. Um, the, bank, the, the bond uh, in invests 100% of the proceeds in SDG 5 related projects, but especially female um, entrepreneurship with micro and SMEs and small and medium enterprises. Uh, the bond has been subscribed at the level of 10% uh, sorry, 30%, 10 millions by IFC, which also happens to be one of the main issuers on the green platform. Uh, it is for the time being listed on the domestic market, Dar al Salam, but it has already started the process to be listed on the Luxembourg Stock Exchange with display on the Luxembourg Green Exchange. It's in the making. Another similar case um, is, has been brought to market by Barlow World. Barlow World is South African industrial conglomerate. Uh, the structure here is a bit different. It's not a user proceeds bond. It's a sustainability linked bond linked to gender advancement uh, criteria and targets. Uh, one of which is a female representation at board level, which is a relatively uh, standard target within uh, gender finance. There is one more, more innovative target uh, that the, the issuer chose, and that is um, the represent the minimum uh, quota of uh, black women representation in the supply chain. So the innovation is bringing gender, uh, the gender dimension at the level of the supply chain and procurement. Um, well, we, we are very, very proud to be working with the United Nations because we believe that acting within that framework allows us to magnify the political importance of what is being done by gender finance actors, generally speaking, and by our exchange in particular. We do aspire to be the gender, sorry, the, the exchange dedicated uh, to gender advancement. We are actually the only exchange to have a visibility service uh, that shows the market what's being done at the level of gender advancement, knowing that more and more mandates are coming from investors that are exclusively target uh, gender factors. Thank you, Chiara. And I, I can really confirm that that MOU we signed with UN Women really concretizes with a strong action plan, follow up every month. So that's really important also for us to foster uh, gender finance. Now, I wanted to know if there is uh, any plans to develop specific emerging market services than at the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. Well, uh, so far, um, I have to make it clear that our services are not issuer country specific. Actually, all of our services are pretty much country agnostic. Um, this, uh, there are some services we launched uh, recently that are picking up quite well with emerging markets, even better than the broader um, uh, uh, developed markets audience which we had in mind in the first place. One of these is the Academy. I mentioned it before. It's a great thing that we can run it online because we could accommodate participation from Asia to Africa to Latin America, and one-third of participants have been coming by 
private and public sector uh, representatives in emerging markets. Uh, we have an additional service uh, that is also picking up very well with emerging markets, which is technical assistance. It's pretty much of a customized service in which we give uh, hands-on interpretation of theoretical guidance. So we are helping, as for Capverde, uh, issuer or other participants with their own um, uh, acceleration uh, opportunities within the space of sustainable finance in many different ways. And last but not least, assistance services. Assistance services are very close to our core business. We do help uh, issuer uh, of uh, labeled uh, green social sustainability, sustainability link products to improve their disclosures, both ex ante or at issuance, and on an ongoing basis after the product has been launched. How do we do that? We have a team of analysts that is uh, uh, very busy on a daily basis to analyze a number of documents, and they can define the average level of disclosure and the best levels of disclosure and benchmark it sector by sector, geography by geography, to give out some recommendation to the issuers on how they could present themselves uh, in the most credible way to investors. And, and we believe there is a strong potential for uh, issuers to diversify themselves when it's about disclosures, granularity, commitment, KPIs that are more or less attuned to their investor space. And again, this is a service that has picked up very well with emerging markets. Last but not least, we have a data hub. The data hub is um, the only data hub for labeled green social sustain sustainability and sustainability link securities that covers the whole set of pre issuance and post issuance phases the whole universe of whatever is listed, not just in Luxembourg, but worldwide. Of course, it does have a fair representation of emerging market data to the extent, of course, these are coming from codified product. You know they're not enough yet, but for that, is, uh, that part is covered by our data, uh, data hub. And that has allowed us to cooperate with the uh, OECD and allow them uh, the research team to publish a uh, stock taking report on where the GSSS market is actually today with recommendation of course from a policy perspective. So we're very proud that even on the data side we're doing something to advance awareness and allow policymaker to take action on that. Thank you Chiara for uh, sharing these uh, concrete examples of uh, what LAXASI is doing. Please join me in uh, thanking Chiara again. Thank you everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, we had very insightful and engaging uh, discussions today. We had a lot uh, of work in terms of cooperation and collaboration today with the DGGI to come up to this event. But we don't want to stop our cooperation here in Egypt. We want to continue it with the DGGI. Uh, that's why the Luxembourg Stock Exchange has uh, signed a letter of intent to really demonstrate our intention and commitment to work uh, concretely on uh, common actions in Africa. Um, so that uh, intention to work with GGGI will be focused on specific activities, for example, capacity building, where we'll be developing specific trainings, specific uh, materials for uh, entities in the region, according to the specificities that we have already mentioned. We'll also be working on the data side, so as much as we can help also on that side, for all the players in the industry to understand where they stand, to benchmark themselves, to do their reporting. It's also very important. And we'll also aim to collaborate on advocacy. I believe it's extremely important. We mentioned it around gender finance, but it's essential in the whole sustainable finance uh, so that issuers, but also regulators, central banks, stock exchanges, they all understand what we are talking about. Um, so. Without that, um, that's one aspect of the cooperation that uh, GGGI has with the Luxembourg Stock Exchange, but I believe there are other uh, collaborations in the pipeline. And for that, I would like to invite uh, Frank again to say a few words about those other collab collaborations. Thank you. That was a very interesting side event, I thought. We had a lot of very good messages. I couldn't agree with more. We could talk about this for a long time. But uh, for now, I'd just like to use the opportunity to talk about our 
increasing partnership with Luxembourg. Uh, from 2016, we had a very strong collaboration, particularly not through Virginie's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, not through the 1% of ODA, but through Luxembourg International Climate Finance Fund in all the projects we've had so far. As a result of that, Luxembourg announced last year they would join GDGI as a member, and it was my pleasure earlier this summer to sign a host country agreement with three ministries, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, witnessed by Ministries of Finance and Environment, to open an office in Luxembourg uh, soon, before the end of the year. And that office will particularly focus on sustainable finance. And while I'm not from the government of Luxembourg, our colleagues have allowed me to announce today that the Luxembourg government will fund very soon, when we have a chance to sign the contracts, a global program on sustainable finance in which we will partner with the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. That's a program of technical assistance to support all the countries to do the things we talked about here, provide technical assistance to governments, stock exchanges, and others who want to get into these more innovative sustainable finance opportunities, green bonds, and others. So that will be about 5 million euros in the next five years to work very closely with our members and the partners we had today here. So I'm very pleased to uh, be able to announce that and thank the three ministries in the Luxembourg government who will be co-funding that, the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and Sustainable Development, but together with the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I understand that it's the first time that these three ministries come together in doing a joint action, so we're extremely proud to be the delivery partner for that program, together with our partners, the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. So thank you for joining this event. Uh, it was our pleasure to be here today, and we believe we can work together strongly with all of the, the partners on the stage to accelerate green and sustainable finance. Thank you. Leticia. Well, that's uh, a great news, uh, Frank, and we very much look forward to the concrete implementation of that program in the following years. Uh, before we go, I would like to thank once again GGGI for helping us coordinating uh, and, and coordinating sorry, this event. I would like to thank also the EIB for hosting us in this uh, beautiful EIB Benelux Pavilion. Uh, and of course, I would like to thank all the panelists and the speakers that uh, share their very interesting insights with us today. Uh, if I am to leave you with one key message today, um, that would be this. In order to finance the most pressing challenges that we have to face today, we cannot leave anyone behind. That's what our CEO mentioned. Uh, so we must work together as mentors, as advocates, as partners, so that eventually we become the most important things. We become doers. So we need to take action, and we need to take action right now. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today, and I wish you a very nice uh, finance day at COP27.